So once again, I'd like to welcome each one of you um, into this space right now. Um, I'm so thankful that you made it on time um, and you've given us this one and a half hours and we hope to, to honor it well. So just getting started, um, the reason that we're having this session is because as we have been engaging with the participants of the LAPID Leaders Program, we realized that there's a very huge disconnect between a lot of our youth and their communities, their support systems, the parents, the uncles, and, and friends and relatives. Um, because our young people are very ambitious and they're very, very driven. Um, and many times, uh, we get lost in the details, trying to figure out what is this person trying to say, what is this person trying to do, vis-a-vis -vis what we know and we, what we have understood as the way the world works. And one of the biggest um, challenges that some of our students are going through is that they find that they really, really, really have to defend their, their time when they're doing the LAPID programs and the classes are on, uh, because many of the parents just don't understand the connection between uh, LAPID leaders and programs such as LAPID leaders and how that will um, help the young people secure employment and, and succeed after college. So the reason that we are having this session today really is to have a look at what is the marketplace looking like right now? Who are they looking for? And I'd like in the back of your mind for you to think about the young person in your life, whether or not they're doing rapid leaders. And by the end of this conversation, we'd like you to be in a place where you better understand the reality on the ground in terms of hiring and job security and what success could look like for our young people and also your place in it. Also throughout the conversation, we will be welcoming your questions. Please put your questions in the chat room. Um, we, we have someone in the chat room who's just scouring for your questions and they will give us um, the questions that we will address as we go along. So once again, karibuni sana and thank you for your time. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce uh, LAPID Leaders uh, to you. LAPID Leaders is a nonprofit organization whose vision is to build a community of value-driven young leaders. Value-driven young leaders who are dedicated to being solution providers, change makers, and the kind of people that we want to see in the marketplace today. And the LAPID Leaders experience is carefully created to build confidence and self-awareness for the participants, stretch them, equip them with the soft skills and the experiences that are market relevant and that employers look for in fresh hires. And also to expand their horizons of what is possible as they learn to take control of their success, of their careers, and the things that they want to do once they're done with uh, campus. Now, the thing is, um, a lot of our alumni, more than 80% of people who complete the program, find very good jobs within six months of completing the program. And many grow within the organizations very fast. A career journey that could have taken 10 years, many of them go through them between three and five years. Um, due to the training and the experience and the exposure they get through the experience. Um, and Lapid Leaders is founded by a market trailblazer called Esther Moniki, who's just graduated from an exclusive public service program in New York. And uh, she's very passionate about drawing out the possibilities from African youth and just pushing them that further, stretching them that much more so that when they go out there into the workplace, they are excellent in everything that they do. So today we will hear from marketplace experts about what a job ready young person is, the realities in the marketplace that they may or may not be prepared for in college and how all this ties together into what we're doing here at Lapid Africa and, and what your role is. So again, please engage us in the chat room. We have our team member, Frank, who will be collating your questions as we go along, and we will be sure to respond in the Q&A part of this conversation. So to introduce the panel, Gadoni, it's good to see you. Karibo. Uh, Gadoni Moura is a talent acquisition specialist, 
who's uh, a certified HR BP. Gadoni, please tell us what that is uh, as you introduce yourself in a few minutes. And she carries 10 years of experience across multiple sectors in consulting, in logistics, agri-tech insurance, energy, um, all over Africa and parts of North America. So she's worked with DHL, Deloitte, McKinsey, and is now at Pula Advisors, which is a social impact management advisory firm where she leads the global recruitment across three continents, that's Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Gathani's vision is for an informed job market on both the employer's end and potential employees. We also have on our panel today, Jemima Karugo, who currently serves as a people operations manager, overseeing the HR function in over 17 countries around the world. She's a seasoned HR professional with over 10 years of experience. And she is passionate about people learning, growing and winning. She envisions an Africa that no longer asks for permission to be. And we have Susan Muthi. Susan is an executive trainer in leadership and management, and she carries more than 20 years of experience. She's passionate about stimulating people to see the world with a fresh perspective and to find innovative solutions in their leadership capacity. So we're proud to have her executive oversight in the Lapid Leaders community. And in short, these are the people who are leading our conversation today. So I'd like to give each one of them one minute to introduce themselves. So Gadoni, please introduce yourself in one minute, Jemima in one minute, and Susan in one minute. Karibuni. Thank you. Um, I'll start off with my one minute by saying my last name is actually Mwangi, not Mwaura. So I want to give all due respect to, to my father who named me Gadoni Mwangi. Um, nice to be here. I am, I am really privileged to be here. I think there was a tussle between, you know, should I be here? I'm not a parent. Um, I have an amazing niece who you might see come into, into the video soon. She's staying with me. Um, but I'm here mainly because um, I'm the one who hires your, your youth. Right, and I've been doing it since um, 2012, 2013. So I think I have a pretty good understanding of you know what a happy medium looks like for for you and um, and your loved ones. So happy to be here. Thank you for for having me on board. Jemima. Yes. Hi, Gavani. How are you? Good. Doing well. Doing well. It's good to see you. Um, so like Mutindi mentioned, thank you so much for introducing me. I am Jemima Karugo, and I am the People Operations Manager at an organization called Cross Boundary. And when your children move from Ugadoni, who's the recruiter, they come to my hands as the HR. And I have to work with them throughout their professional journey. And I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation um, around what we see and as a parent myself a parent of a teenager who in a few years is going to be in the workplace what are some of the things that we can talk about or you could potentially start doing just so that your children are transitioning a little bit easier into the workplace thank you susan over to you thank you jemima um for that handing over Hi, Gavoni, pleasure to meet you and to be on the panel with you. Um, and I like the way um, Jemima has put it. When she, um, you then are handed over, your children are then handed over to Jemima. I also then come in at the very tail end and I'm the one that is plugging in where the issues and challenges are in terms of management and leadership um, training and basically upskilling them and continuous education, continuous um, leadership management development um, for them there so that really they're able to function better within that particular space that they have, um, they're finding themselves in. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and we definitely will, will be able to join the dots for you 
in terms of where you're at and what is needed when your children are sitting in a work environment. Thank you. Thank you once again, Gothoni. I want to apologize publicly um, and honor Mr. Mwangi and this is Gadoni Mwangi, not Mora. That was my bad. Um, and, and thank you for being so graceful about it. So as we get into the thick of this conversation, I have one question to ask each of you. And again, you have between one and maybe one and a half minutes <laughs> to, to answer this question for us. Um, there's this thing that many people are saying, and you see it in the reports um, by World Bank and all these other international figures that are very concerned with the African population size, as they try to tell us to reduce our population and we're refusing. And the question is that these many reports indicate that um, by the year 2020, that Africa will have the highest percentage of young people in the world. And I just want to hear from you. I don't want to shape how that answer comes out, but um, what is your thought about that one statement that by 2020, Africa will have the highest percentage of young people in the world? Um, again, let's start with Gadoni and then Jemima and then Susan. Thank you, Matilde. I hope at some point we'll reverse the order because uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to always be the one starting, but um, yeah, I, I tend to not necessarily, I'm not sure how accurate that might be to date because of Asia, but um, I'm not surprised, you know, that, that Africa is, is top of the list in terms of having the, the most young people. Um, but I think the, the deeper question is, what are those young people doing? What are they up to? Um, you know, are they employed? Are they self-employed, right? Um, I think that there's many ways we can unbox that, that statement. Um, and even if they're employed or unemployed, et cetera, um, are they productive members of society, right? Um, because I think at the end of the day, it's important for us to, to think of um, our youth as a, as a vessel also for the future. It's not just about, you know, can they get jobs? Can they sustain, you know, themselves and right now, but what pathway are they creating for the, for the next set of youth, right? Um, what pathway are they creating for, for their own group um, amongst themselves? Um, and how are they going to impact other continents? There's something interesting Jemima had said in her introduction, um, which essentially with me settled at it's time for Africa. Right. Um, so in them being, um, you know, productive members of society, um, being able to, to support themselves and, and future generations, how are they also depicting Africa in the wider market? Um, I think we've been a forgotten continent for a long time. Um, in fact, one of my biggest um, gratitude pieces was when we were being called in East Africa, the hotbed of, of technology. You know, it sounded catchy, but I was like, I finally we've been seen, you know, beyond the poverty, beyond the, um, it's a great place for expatriates to work and take over, right? Um, so I, I would want to see more of that. What are we going to be the hotbed of? And there are going to be those voices for us um, to, to the Latin America market, to the, North American market to the Asia markets um, and start opening up people's eyes, people's conversations beyond us being um, here in Africa at the completely underprivileged um, you know, level of the spectrum. So those are my initial thoughts. I'll, I'll hand over to, to Jemima. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm actually very excited about that particular statement. Um, I don't know how true it is, uh, because I feel like the Asia market still has a fair bit of a youthful population. Um, however, if Africa is to be the next frontier, I think one of the things that we need to start looking at is, as parents, what are some of the education opportunities that we're providing to our children? what kind of degrees are we asking them to go to school and study or guiding them? 
because we should not be telling our children what to study. Um, and, and the reason why I think it's very exciting is because in the US and Europe right now, we are seeing something that I believe all of us have had on this table is the great resignation. And what that has prompted is a lot of these large organizations are now looking at Africa. And they're not looking at the entirety of the continent. They're looking at specific markets, the markets being Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, maybe Egypt and Morocco in the north. And that essentially means that there's something there that we could potentially provide as a talent market. But what they've also found out when they've come here is that there still is there, there, there's a gap between the skill set that they would like versus the skill set that we have. And I think that is why, to the Ronnie's point, there's a reason why expatriates, when they come down to Kenya, they tend to prosper because they're bringing in solutions which we already have, but we quite haven't figured out how to break it down. Um, it will be very, very exciting to see what do our young people do with that information also. If you believe that you're the talent of the future, if you believe that your generation is gonna be the youngest in history or whatever that looks like, how are you gonna take over the world? Because this is literally an opportunity for African youth to take over the world, provide African solutions to the world. Right now, we are operating in a space where the West has kind of given us solutions to each and every problem, including our own problems, whether they understand it or not. Um, and I think depending on how Africa embraces it, and, and this is layered, um, it's layered in politics, in education, infrastructure. So there's like a lot of it going up and down. Um, but I think depending on how we unpack it, it could be an amazing, amazing opportunity. And if we do not package it properly, we might have a very big problem in the future. Okay, thank you so much, Jamima. Susan, if I may just jump in before uh, you, you, you respond. Um, I just noted something that you said, Jamima, which is in the West, they're experiencing something that is called the great resignation. And I feel like it's a good um, opportunity to just explain what that is. Um, to our audience. So the great resignation is that post COVID, a lot of people around the world discovered that they are um, not satisfied um, with the way the workplace is. They realize that there's more to live for and they don't have to be tied down to an office. So a lot of people are resigning formal jobs and even the shape of what a job is, is changing as we speak. We can't say that um, if in our minds we are still thinking that uh, a good job is somewhere where you go to the office and you have a title that everyone can understand, that definition right now post COVID is changing. Um, and the opportunity then for our young people then is to define what work is, to redefine what work is. And now we are noticing that the world is looking at Africa for people who are willing to work for a talent force. So Jamima, Kadani, Susan, if I have uh, miss misinterpreted what we are saying, please let me know. <laughs> so oh, Susan, oh, you got it. You got it. yeah. So again, you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Susan, what does um, Africa having the largest number of youth by 2030 um, mean for you or to you? Um, I like what Gadoni said, the way she jumped in. Um, because of, of Asia, and also like how uh, what Jemani put said, in terms of it's just not the numbers, but what are the numbers doing? Oh yeah, those numbers. Because really, when you're talking about um, ten to eleven million youth across Africa entering the job market, and there's only space for three million of formally created. Whereas there's a lot of potential waste there. For me, I look at it and I say, there is that for me tells me that Africa, really there is so, 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 so much scope. If we would just be able to quote unquote stop and think what that means. 
because like um, you see, there's a great resignation in America and um, there's all this talent when you're seeing um, um, global companies relocating to Africa, relocating to Kenya. And of course, it's like um, Jemima said, it's not every, every country, it's specific countries. When um, people say that Kenya, the Kenyans have got a very, very good work ethic compared to many other African countries, what that begins to tell me as an African parent, now let me bring it home in terms of as an African parent, what does it mean for me and my child? Um, it means that there is a need in all of Africa, but my child needs to be well equipped to be able to meet this child, to meet this challenge, because my child will stand up head and shoulders above the rest. And so in terms of those numbers, um, they're just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But it also means that there is so much scope for the formation of not just employment opportunities, because I think that is something that really, really needs to shift. Because all too often, um, and okay, stand corrected, um, please, but definitely within, let me talk for Kenya, our education system is geared to creating employees, people that are just competent enough to be able to deliver on the job. And in doing that, there is a lot of ki killing or minimizing the innovation, the creativity that is needed for entrepreneurial uh, for entrepreneurship. And it is in the entrepreneurs that will create the jobs, the formal employment. When Susan comes in uh, or creates um, her company as an entrepreneur, I'm the one that will create the formal employment. I'm the one that will begin to fill in the job market. I'm the one that will create space for the 10 to 11 million um, people across Africa, or even if it's 3 million in Kenya or a million people in Kenya, that will be filling in that. So I think this has got to be, we've got to look at it very macro and micro. And as parents begin to allow our children to have that expression and explore their potential, because it is in the exploration of their potential that even the numbers begin to make sense. Um, I think that for me is what those numbers say for me, because there's a lot of potential in Africa, but what are we doing with that potential? How are we putting it to good use or not? Because if we don't put it to good use, um, Asia's rising, South America's rising, Africa will lose it, we will lose it, yet, a lot of the mineral resources are also resident in Africa. And I, I just throw that in as I, as I come to an end. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Susan. So what I am hearing is that this is a very big opportunity. And the generation of young people who are finishing school right now and preparing to enter the workforce have the opportunity to be pioneers in their own right. Because for the first time, the world is looking at Africa for solutions. So what is our job and how do we support these young people? Um, first, before we answer that question, let us um, begin now to understand, you know, Gathani, you say you don't want to be the first one, but these questions were curated no, no, no. with names. I'm, I'm ready. The <laughs> questions asked before, anyway, but I'm ready, let's, let's do this. Uh, curated with your name on it. Um, but but Gadoni, this really is your question, but I invite the other panelists to chime in for less than one minute. Um, but Gadoni is a talent recruiter. What does a job ready young person look like today? Who are you looking for? What are you looking for? And do the current education systems that we have, particularly the universities, because this is where we, we, are, we, are, we are talking about, we are talking about developing uh, recent graduates or young people who are about to graduate. Um, please speak into that so that um, our audience can have an idea of what it is that uh, recruiters are looking for in, in a fresh hire today. 
you know, that, that was a very difficult question for, for me to tackle. Um, and to some of you, it might seem easy. You know, can they speak? Can they write? Did they graduate top, top of the class? Um, but the job place has evolved so much. Um, and it, it, it has evolved even further, depending on the industry, right? So what I look for in a consultant was very different than what I looked for in, in a logistics person, in a sales person, in a management trainee versus just an intern. So I want to share a disclaimer that I will share some guidelines on what a job ready youth looks like, but it varies depending on the sector, private, public, when I say public, I mean government of Kenya, right? Um, some of the, the skills I'll share, they are not looking for their right in, in the public sector. Uh, but um, I think this, this caveat will allow people to, to open their minds a bit that what I'm saying is not hard pressed in stone, it's just a guideline. Um, and I think the easiest way to, to tackle it is if you ask yourself, would I hire my youth and you objectively answer that question, you'll be able to address the, is my youth job ready question, right? Um, so if, if you can take a second for yourself and even just think about it, think not only of your direct youth, right? Not your child necessarily, but if I was to think of my niece, except she's two right now. Um, I have a cousin who is uh, 24. Um, and I've just referred her for a job, but I was very proud to refer her because I know what she, her qualities are. She's a great speaker, right? So that brings me to my first one, communication skills. It's important. Um, in the workplace today, you have to be able to not only just open your mouth, but make sense of, of what your thought process is and share it with your colleagues. Um, sometimes you'll be involved in meetings that, you know, are beyond your years. And it's really happening a lot these days, right? Um, especially in, in smaller businesses, NGOs, startups. Um, and as we know here in Africa, it's the hotbed of, of startups. So if your youth is getting a job in one of these startups, you'll find that they're telling you, hey, mom, hey, dad, I have a meeting and I'm supposed to address the whole company. Mind you, the whole company is 10 people, but you know, regardless, they need to be able to present, to articulate themselves. And it's important that you as, as a parent, give them room to do that, right? Don't shut down conversation when, um, you know, when you disagree with something, let them express their thoughts, let them start practicing, um, communicating in leadership or with leadership, right? Right at the home. Um, so that's the number one key skill I would say is, is there. Then the second one um, is problem solving. It's a very fancy way for just being able to find solutions, right? And we problem solve in so many aspects. Um, we just don't understand that the concept is called problem solving. It's finding plan B, plan C, all the way up to Z, right? Um, that is essentially what problem solving is. And every day, there's different scenarios you'll have to problem solve. The printer doesn't have paper. We don't have petty cash to go and buy more printing paper. That is actually problem solving, right? If you come up with a couple of solutions, right? Maybe go next door, see if you can borrow printing paper from, from um, your fellow company, etc. But now on the bigger level, um, this event can't take place. We don't have the, the right budget. Um, the vendors are asking for XXX amount, what can I do? Who can I call? Um, where can I leverage my, my resources to ensure this event happens? The ability to just be able to think about what should plan B be, what should plan C be? That is problem solving. Solving the problem does not mean you are good or bad at problem solving, right? It's being able to come up with a plethora of ideas and potential solutions that could work. That is the skill that employers are looking for um, because ownership is a big deal these days, right? I want to be able to focus on what I'm doing for the next six hours and not worry, is, is my intern going to need my support on, on this assignment? How are they doing? Let me check in on them, right? Because consequently, the youth of today do not like being micromanaged. 
right? So there needs to be a balance there of, um, I want to place trust in you, but could you give me some clues that I should place trust in you and you can take ownership of your role? And the key to doing that is that problem solving capability, right? Another one I want to, to point out is a professional attitude. Now, again, professional varies by industry, by sector, by space, even by country. Um, I'll give you a scenario. I work with a very mixed group of, of people, but whenever I'm addressing um, our managers based in India, I call them sir. Here in Kenya, I don't call anybody sir. I call them by their first name. Um, if they're much more mature, um, I call them Mr. So-and-so, right? Or Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. But with the India community, I have to address them in, in that way. Not have to necessarily, but I have to understand that that is how they view professionalism. So just as I adjust my style, um, similarly, the youth and your, your children should be able to adjust their style depending on the scenario. Um, there's somebody I interviewed a couple of, of weeks ago and we had a coaching session. Um, he has less than four years experience. I work for a startup and I told him, you're meeting the CEO, so you might want to wear a, a button down shirt, right? Um, even if you're meeting on, on Zoom, and his response to me was, I should be taken as I am. And I said, that's okay. We'll take you as you are. But do you want to give someone the opportunity to know who you are or place an immediate judgment on you when they see you in that jumper for a formal interview, for a formal job, full-time, permanent? Right? So I think there's, there's always a time and a place which... which um, some youth might disagree, but that's the truth. That is how it's being received out here, right? So having that professional attitude to say, yes, I can be myself, but I also have to meet the company halfway. How do I present professionally? What do they view as professional versus what I view as professional? How do I bridge that gap? Um, also keep in mind, the idea of professionalism has changed, right? Um, Wearing, um, I remember I had an internship at National Bank of Kenya and I bought my first skirt suit, right? Those days, because I'm working in banking and you know, this was going to be deemed as a professional outfit. Today, I don't own a single skirt suit, right? Um, and that's now in the clothing aspect, but in the communication aspect as well, there are many caveats to say, this used to be viewed as strictly professional. Now there's a broader spectrum of what we are viewing as professional. So I think it's important for you as parents as well to start briefing yourselves on what is viewed as professional these days. Can I wear jeans on a Wednesday? Yes, some companies allow you to do so, right? So we, we need to equally open up our minds as we educate our youth. Um, and Mutini, thank you to stop me if, if I'm going over time. And then the, the other thing I want to really, really emphasize, and this is a big one, team ethic, teamwork, collaboration. That is what I really look for. You'll find for, for roles which are internships, management, training, um, et cetera, the entry level jobs, candidates are usually processed in batch, right? Versus when I'm recruiting for an executive, it's a very exclusive, almost one-on-one -on -one process. That's why you'll find the safari comes, the Unilevers, um, even the McKinsey's is hosting something called an assessment center. So you're being interviewed, but it's a sort of a group setting, right? You're required to, to build a puzzle together. You're required to, to do some sort of team building activity together. That is still an interview process. But um, we want to see, can you work with others as well, right? Can you collaborate? Can you communicate with them? Can you take the leadership role at times and can you take the back seat at other times, right? So this team, team ethic, teamwork, ethic collaboration is very, very key. And how do they build it in university? Student clubs. It's as simple as that. You can not only be books, books, books in the class 110%. These student clubs are actually building everyday soft skills that are required on the job. So I'll pause there because I had I had one minute. <laughs> Back to you, Motindi. Thank you so, so much, Gadoni. At this point, I'd like to invite any questions in the chat. 
uh, from our audience. Uh, please feel free to ask for questions or clarifications. If there's something that you have been seeing with the young people around you and you're not so sure what's going on there, please ask that in the chat. Um, you will get uh, those questions answered today. So now the next question is for Jemima. And Jemima, what are the challenges that you are seeing with new hires? Uh, Jemima, you have eight minutes, so uh, please, um, just work within the eight minutes uh, with your response for that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, I, th I think my responses are probably going to be very similar to the one because it kind of starts at the point of recruitment. So the way interviews are structured has changed over time. Um, I remember my first interview in my first job. Um, my first job was at PricewaterhouseCoopers. It was very standard. Where do you see yourself in five years? Why do you want this job? But the interviews have changed as I have grown in my career, which means you have more scenario-based interviews. And the reason why you have more scenario-based interviews is because of the points that Japanese has mentioned. They want to see, do you have any problem-solving skills? Um, are you a critical thinker? And one of the things that I have found, and as a parent with a child in 844, I've seen that a lot, is that a lot of our Kenyan students, including us as parents, is that we were all taught in school that every question has a right answer. And what that did to us, unfortunately, is that it kind of chipped into the process of critical thinking. So we do not try to unpack any question. We just try to find the right answer. And that is where a lot of people tend to fall off in an interview process. And if by some miracle, you end up getting into the work workforce, you're going to find a team or a manager who's looking at you and they're saying, we have this problem that we're trying to solve either for the business internally or for our clients externally. And we want to have a brainstorming session. You cannot be the individual that sits in a corner and takes notes. We want people who are involved. We want people because all of us have opinions about everything. And that opinion is what we want you to speak up. Um, and I've noticed something very interesting in my career, um, which is for those of us who are fully educated in Kenya, like from nursery school all the way to campus like myself, versus those who had an opportunity to go abroad and then come back, when we get into a meeting, it's very, very different. You'll find this one who went to the UK or the US is a bit bold. They want to ask questions. They want to challenge authority. I was not raised to challenge authority. But then over my career, one thing that I have been taught is that just because you're older, just because you're senior, does not necessarily mean you have a solution to a problem. And it is okay for me to actually push back. And push your idea a little bit. Just say, I hear you, but actually that's not how that works. If you're in a space where you're working with somebody who does not understand the market quite as you do, you're the expert in that room and that is how you should conduct yourself as the expert in that room. Um, and every time I see, or rather every time managers are coming to me and they're complaining about an individual, most of the time, it's usually some of the issues that I'm going to reiterate that Gavani has already mentioned. So it's around problem solving, it's around critical thinking. It's also around emotional intelligence, EQ. How are you dealing with a stressful situation? How are you dealing with a stressful manager? Um, it's very easy for us to go into a corner and decide, you know what, it's fine. I am leaving this job and simply because the manager disagreed with you or gave you feedback that you do not think was very good, right? Um, but then emotional intelligence comes in the space of you don't always know everything. It is okay to also open your mind and be open to learning. It is also okay for you to receive feedback, um, not just positive feedback, but also critical feedback. And how you use that feedback determines how you grow. And emotional intelligence, unfortunately, is not something that you can be taught in school. It's something that you have to cultivate over time. And even as adults, even however old we are, there are still some adults who do not have it. 
And every time I think of an example of somebody with great EQ, the one person I can think of is the late Roy Kibaki. And the reason why I say that is because for a man who got a lot of attacks during his political life cycle, he was very unbothered by it. Um, but then when you look at some politicians, and I'm using politicians here not because I support any, I'm just trying to give a very common example here. Um, when you look at some politicians and how they respond to criticism, kind of tells you where their emotional intelligence lies. And when you're thinking about emotional intelligence, think about that. How does somebody who's a bit more emboldened react to something that technically should not bother them? And how does somebody else react to something that they could potentially use as feedback? Um, that critic, take it, turn it into a positive or fix something. Um, something else, and this is on the softer side, would be the people coming into the workspace, the younger generation right now, they do not know how to manage stress. And we are living in a period, we're living in a time where everything is very fast paced and it is not fast paced outside the office or outside of work, it is fast paced everywhere. So this individuals, they get a job, and I'm speaking as a HR manager who has had to sit down with individuals and actually work them through this, is you get your first job and you're very excited and you go to your, your mom and your dad and you tell them, mom, I got a job and my starting salary is like a thousand shillings. And because of our school, but some of us were never taught that when they give you a contract of 90,000 shillings, they do not tell you that they will tax you. So you assume that you're getting 90,000, which is also probably has to do with our education system. And I have seen those people coming in and not being able to manage their finances. And unfortunately, if you're stressed outside, it is very, very difficult for you to perform optimally in your workspace. And as parents here, I think one, um, I think somebody who's, I can hear that. Uh, we can hear you clearly, uh, Jemima, don't worry. No, it's fine. I think somebody was unmuted and I could hear the. It's fine. Okay. Um, okay, somebody needs to mute. I'm not sure who it is. Okay, all good now. Um, and when I talk of managing stress, I think this one I'm speaking specifically to parents. Um, the way we are, is, the way our community is, is that for some of us, we have to pay black tax, which essentially means you were taken to school, you were given opportunities, you're the first one to get a job. So guess what? Whatever you're earning right now belongs to the community. But when you look at inflation, when you look at individual needs, it is very difficult for this young person to come into the workspace and then have to support a community of 15 with 90,000 shillings. And I think part of it is as parents out there, how do you start protecting your young ones? How do you start protecting the individuals that are coming in to work by giving them an opportunity to grow? And part of it is also, I, I think we also need to start thinking as parents, how do we start breaking this generational behavior, which is do not start expecting that the young person who has started a job means that they now have to take care of you financially and now you can retire. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think we have to be able to deal with that or have a conversation with that very clearly. Um, and I can see Gabani, I would say there was an advocate of um, um, Yes, I agree with you. We do not have these conversations. We do not have conversations on how to manage our emotions. We don't know. We don't yeah, Jamima, have... we might need to read out that uh, comment uh, for those of us who may not be able to read on the chat. So uh, Gadoni is saying that she wants to play the devil's advocate on the youth not being able to manage stress. And she asked, is it because stress was not a topic discussed openly in the household? How does it look like? How do you manage it? Uh, and she says conversations today are much more transparent and the youth are open to sharing when they are not operating at their best. And so. I agree with that completely. Um, and while I do agree with that, I, I think there's also some nuance to be said that 
while they will discuss this with us, with the HR professionals in the workspace, do they actually or actively go out and discuss with the people providing the stress or bringing the stress, right? Um, and I think the last one has to do with the grass being greener on the other side. Um, and part of it has to do with expectations when they come into the workspace. Um, you come in and then your friend tells you, oh, I got a job in this other place and they're paying me 50% more, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, um, but I usually look at it as they don't necessarily give themselves enough time to learn because they want to consistently look for the next bigger, shinier thing. Um, and speaking as a millennial myself, and I remember when we got into the workspace, it was the same thing that everybody kept saying about us, which was, we don't stay in one place. We are consistently trying to look for the next shinier, bigger thing. And as somebody who has been there for a bit now, I do understand the conversation around settling down. And the settling down has to do with experience and learning. And that does not necessarily mean that you have to be stuck there for eternity. Um, but I think the one thing that I would urge young people, maybe as parents, is yes, have all the opportunities that you can, but also give yourself an opportunity to just settle down, learn, and then when you're moving to the next space, you're moving into something bigger and better rather than, rather than consistently moving practically. So you came in as an office administrator, you're just consistently moving to the next job as an office administrator. Um, ideally, we should be moving from here and we're trying to go up because there's a skill set that you have had in between here. Um, okay. And I think that is enough. So let me stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jemima. Remember, please ask your questions in the chat box. We're going to have a short Q&A session uh, right after this. And before I ask Susan her question, um, a few things that Jemima said that um, I just feel that they're very important to underline. Um, I had the I had the privilege, I've had the privilege of supporting a lot of uh, my former clients and former places of work in, in, in hiring. And I'm primarily a communication person. So um, that, that is the space in which we're hiring for. And one of the craziest things that, um, that I saw was that you would have people applying for entry level jobs with very high level um, degrees, with a master's degree, or with a postgraduate uh, certificate, very, very high level. But when you bring those people to the interview, you wonder, is this is this the same person who applied or what? Because they can't speak. They can't even tell you what is in their CV. And the crazy experience that I had is at some point I actually had to advise a client, why don't you just hire someone who has done A-levels in a British system school or an American system school, you will get a higher quality of candidate for this entry level communications position. And some actually did. Um, but I don't want to vilify the Kenyan education system because that is not the point. But I feel like the place where uh, you as parents can begin to create space for your young person to find themselves and find their confidence is uh, something very simple, like give them responsibility, allow them to fail within your safe space so that they can begin to understand what they can do and what they cannot do. And what it is to, if you run a shop, what it is to actually manage the clients for the shop. Uh, because those little things add up so that by the time someone is done with university, they not only have a paper, but when they present themselves on the interview table, you can tell that this is someone who knows how to communicate. It doesn't have to be uh, Kizungu Mingi, but can clearly uh, speak what is in their mind and, and connect it to what it is that they're being asked. It's a very, very simple thing. And, and as parents, as mentors, as siblings, we all have spaces where we can invite the young people in our lives to that space and allow them to, to fail while we are watching them and also to ask questions. Just ask, is this really how you dress when you're going to work and why? Because sometimes, sometimes, sometimes what doesn't make sense to you is exactly what is necessary in the marketplace today. For example, official communication on WhatsApp, which I am 
me I'm having a problem with because that's not how I was brought up. Don't understand how we are having official communication on WhatsApp, but the young generation, that's where they are. So then we have to adjust and fit in that. So I do not want to eat into Susan's time and I know I've stolen like three minutes of her time. So Susan, please, in less than 10 minutes, if you can do five minutes, it would be good. But please bring this conversation home to our audience today. As a trainer, where are the young people who you are engaging with right now? What are the things that you're seeing that they are struggling with that perhaps as parents, as mentors, as opinion shapers and gatekeepers in their lives that we can plug in and support them to take advantage of the opportunities presented by the situation we find ourselves in where the world is looking to Africa for workers and solutions. So Susan, please, five minutes would be good. Five minutes would be very good. <laughs> Um, thank you for that, Cindy. This is, hmm. you want me to bring this baby home for landing. I've agreed with everything um, that Gadoni and Jemima have said, and it's, as a trainer, I see it. But as a parent, I think what needs to really happen, if I'm going to put it in a nice bowl, is the marketplace needs a whole person. We need our youth to be whole, to bring the totality of themselves to the market space. The, the, the skills that um, have been mentioned, that is definitely one input. The emotional intelligence is one, is definitely it. Being able to manage lead self, manage stress, time management, all that work ethic is definitely a huge part of it, absolutely. But for where we are going, and this is why um, just having the, you see, let me backtrack a bit and tell a story. I'll back, I'll, I'll, okay, there's so, sorry, there's so many things going on in my head right now. I don't even know where to start with that story, um, Tindy, but let me let me do this. Let me, let me try and break this elephant down. You see, one thing I've noticed as a trainer is that very many people, not only the youth, huh? I don't want to say that, even the older generation, because I've been training for 20 years, people bring what they call discretionary skills to the table, to the organization. I can choose to solve the problem or I cannot choose to solve the problem. And a lot of that has also got to do with the fact that people don't know their whole. When I say whole, I'm talking about also psychologically, emotionally whole, such that the person, when Susan comes into the work environment, she's bringing the totality of herself. Susan doesn't have the luxury of removing things, like a jacket, hanging it on the doorknob, working, working, working. Then when she walks back out, she puts it on and goes. The same challenges, there's a dimension where I'm talking about wholeness. The same challenges that you as parents have faced in terms of being able to deal with life issues and life skills are the same challenges that the, your, our children, our youth are facing. And I would therefore then say that as parents, it would be good because I understand that we've gotten into a place of where we're so busy working and we've formed a, uh, we've formed a, a mental picture of what success should look like, will look like, that we have forgotten how we were when we started working. We've forgotten our youth. We've forgotten... Um, um what we needed and because we've forgotten that and we've had to figure it out we forget as parents to be the first mentors to our children we there's a dimension of where we outsource parenting to the schools I'm giving them to the school, it's for the teacher to do this, for the teacher to do that, and it's for the teacher to do that. We've then also outsourced it to households if, we have a, if they're in a position to do that. 
and I get it, and this is not to bash or guilt trip or condemn anybody, but it's to, it's I, what I want, I'm doing in that is pulling us back to see that the first role, me as a corporate trainer, as a coach, as a mentor in the workspace, there's only so much I can do. I'm actually coming in and I'm doing damage control. So the question that I raise up here is how do we begin to actually even literally mentor, educate and prepare our children for life? Yes, we want to give them the best in terms of, um, they don't have to go through the same hardships that we went through, but we forget that it is the, some of those hardships that we went through that have made us the people we are today and we are better able and capable of dealing with issues. So, in terms of what are the opportunities and, and where are we going, I think the biggest opportunities lies for a person who is able to come to the workplace home in terms of education in terms and in terms of soft skills. Because that is the person that, again, will rise um, ahead of um, head and shoulders above everybody else. Then I also want us to take a step back and challenge it, us as parents as well, and flip and put on the next, um, another cap. We are the employers, we are the managers. We in this room are the employers, we are the managers. And this child, this youth that has recently been employed is somebody else's youth, somebody else's child. And learning to deal with them in that way. Not looking them as another person, but looking at them as this is my son, this is my daughter. That needs to be molded, that needs to be allowed to fail in a safe space. Such that when we go into the workplace as parents, we've also got to see these people, these youth as ours. This is my child. This is the future of Africa. This is the future of Kenya. I need to upskill this person because they might leave and go and start a biashara somewhere. And then it's my cousin or my nephew's child, my nephew or my niece that will be employed there because of the skills that I poured into them. I was told I have a minute and I think I have finished in a minute, but there's so much still to say. Thank you, Tindy. Thank you so much, Susan. I'd just like to thank our panelists for responding and sharing their depth and pouring um, the, of their experiences, what each of them has seen of the young people who are entering the marketplace. And I think that we can agree that it is not a one size fits all solution, but rather each of us have a role to play in enabling these young people to stand up and stand tall as they move into the workplace. Because in their standing up and they're standing tall, you see they're standing on our shoulders. So you're also standing up and standing tall. But um, somehow when Susan was speaking and I'm, I'm sagging us, I'm taking us into the Q&A and I can see um, Mr. Amos Sewe, Sawe has shared something in the chat and I'll get to you. Um, but I was reminded something very interesting that my grandmother said um, a few years ago. My grandmother is a very old lady, but sometimes I wonder whether she lives within her timeline. Um, and she said that when you have a child, you have to have enough to eat and enough to throw away. And that is the only way that you can bring a whole and complete child to the world because you have to have enough to eat and enough to throw away. Um, and now as, as, a, as a young parent, I'm starting to understand what that is. As I teach my young children how to cook, simple things like eggs and, 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 and chai, uh, I, I know half of them will be thrown away because in a Chomeka, the oil is too much, the salt is too much. I know. So I know that I have six eggs and I know out of those six eggs, I'll be lucky if I eat two. But what I will get out of that experience in three months is a very young child who can make breakfast. Is a very young child who can stand in front of, uh, of, of his elders and say, look, this is what I made and I am confident in it. Because at home, I allowed him 
to destroy half the eggs and totally mwaga unga everywhere in the kitchen because in my mind I knew that in bringing up a child I have to have enough to eat and enough to throw away. And as a young adult, and I look at how we relate, uh, okay, I'm not a young adult, I, I passed youth, I'm no longer classified as youth by the government, but I still have parents who are alive. So <laughs> based on that, I begin to appreciate now the space that they allowed for me to fill. Not that they gave me a house when I, when, when I didn't have a house. Of course, I could go back home, but it was not practical because they don't live in Nairobi. But they allowed me to fail and they told me, okay, Tindi, apo umekosea. Na apo yenyewe, iyo moto umejiletea. But you can stand up. You can go back tomorrow and do better. You can do better. Many times we think parenting is about how much we pay and how much we, we, we give in terms of material and money. But more often than not, it's in the moments that you find your young person is looking down. And at a moment, Kasirika, even when you're angry with the foolishness that they have exhibited, for that moment, just say, yes, you did wrong, but you can do better, so show me better. Um, and that still counts, even when the children have grown out of the house. Even today, there are times that I do things and my mother is not very happy. And two, three months later, she'll tell me, Uko, uliko sea. but you can do better. And it continues. Now, Amos Sawe, you said that many of the young generation do not clearly know what they need. And whoever knows is always intimidated by the fact um, that their peers' views of things and their parents' views of things differ from theirs. And um, give me one minute. And they find themselves having low self-esteem. And even in the case of being employed, they find that it's hard to bring out who they are, bring out who they are in their minds. And Jamima, because I know that you had said that you may need to leave early, so I'm going to um, give this to you to respond to, uh, particularly because after Gadoni is done recruiting, the recruits land in your hands. Um, how, how, how is this self-esteem, confident issue um, pulled out in the workplace? And what would a support system at home, um, or, or what would you imagine that a, a good support system at home would be for the hardships that a young person finds in the workplace where they feel they cannot be themselves? Um, Amosawe, I hope that this captures uh, what was in your mind. If not, please let me know. Um, and we are looking for more questions as we are firmly in the question and answer session uh, for the next uh, five minutes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and respond to this as a professional and as a mother. And the way I think about this is very similar to the sentiments that you just expressed a few minutes ago, which is the first space all of us should be given to fail forward should be our homes. We should be allowed to fail forward um, without our mothers or our fathers having a crisis over the fact that we failed. And what I have found based on the conversations that I have had is a lot of the adults who end up in the workspace with very little or no self-esteem if you dig deep, the fear that they grew up with, the fear of either doing something wrong or failing was incredible. And they bring the same fear into the workspace. And because they do not want to cause any ruckus, they do not want um, to be noticed, these are the people who tend to be in the corner. They are not troublemakers. And troublemakers, I'm using this in quotes which means they're not gonna speak up, which means most of the time they're the people who get overlooked when it comes to promotions. And if they're in a good environment, then this is where the HR function will try and provide mentorship and coaching. Um, this is where the learning and development aspect will come in, where we're trying to take you into um, things like Toastmasters so that you can be able to express yourself and express yourself well. Um, do they work for some people? Yes, they do. Um, do they 
not work for other people? Yes, um, because a lot of it is also self -made. Um, And I've had a situation where I had an individual who we could clearly see the potential that they had, but their self-esteem essentially meant that they were unwilling completely to try. And so despite the mentorship and the coaching, because it was not embraced by this individual, it was very difficult to move them from one space to another. And the reason why I'm saying this starts at home. And for those of us with younger children or even with young adults, um, it's not too late to write some of these things, which is human beings are valuable, we all fail. However, you do need to stand up for yourself. You do need to be able to articulate what you need. You do need to be able to accept help. Accepting help does not always mean that you're not good enough. Because in the workspace, if we realize that you need help and we give you a coach, we give you a mentor, or we take you to, um, to do a course, or whatever learning and development need is identified, it is by no means meant to diminish who you are. It is meant to elevate you to the next level. And one of the, a very interesting tidbit that I had um, around this was Margaret Thatcher. And the way Margaret Thatcher, the way we all know how she sounds right now is not always how she used to sound. Um, she was very interested in politics. I wanted to get into it. And the story goes, I do not know, do not put me on this one. I don't know whether it is true or not, but I found it somewhere. I read it and I thought that was really, um, Margaret Thatcher was very interested in politics and she was very passionate about it, but she had a very, um, what, what is it called? A very high pitched voice. And if you know anything about people who have high pitched voices is that they cannot grab attention. And there were people around her who, instead of telling her, this is what we can do so that people can actually take the time to listen to you. There's a lot of derision of, you're not a good communicator. People will not listen to you. But yet there was this one person who told her, you know what we can do? We can actually train you. We can train you. We can train your voice. We can lower the decibel of your voice so that when you start speaking, people, people pause and start listening to you. And I, I, I thought that was, that was an amazing way of looking at self-esteem. Did she know that her voice was high, high pitched? Yeah, she did. She's always had it all her life. And when it came to a space where she needed to move to the next level, people deriding her or people telling her that we could support you in getting you to the next space, she didn't necessarily look at it as, oh, you don't think I can be able to speak or my voice is fine as it is. She actually accepted the help. And right now, she is a very well-renowned um, former prime minister, the late. Um, and I think it's the same concept here. Part of it is, as a parent with young people, tell them about your own failures. Tell them how you overcame those failures. Sometimes you can overcome them yourself, but other times you need support, right? Who are the people that came and supported you? What are some of the tools that they gave you to move from that space to the next? And peer pressure is also there, it's a lot. Um, we have young people right now with companies coming in and paying them so much money. And then you are in the same class, you're probably number one, a student, first class honors. You get a job and your starting salary is 30,000 and this other one is at 100,000, right? The discrepancy is a lot. And depending on who the individual is, your self-esteem can take a beating because of that. Um, and I think it's also the job of spaces like Lapidus to start operating in these spaces and looking at these young people and saying, guess what? All of us don't end up with the same opportunities in life, right? But all of us tend to start from somewhere. For others, they start very high. For other people, not so much. And that's okay. It's a journey. You're 25 years old right now. The world, your life is not ending if you are not earning the same as your friends. We are all on a learning journey. And you're like, what do you do with the space that you have right now? What are you doing with what you have? Um, how are you utilizing what you have to elevate you to the next level? 
Um, and unless there's, I hope I have captured what Amos was trying to ask here. Thank you, thank you. So we want to take uh, at least two more questions. So we want to um, give the floor to our audience, uh, at least two more questions. Um, we have a very short time, we have 10 more minutes. Um, so if we can have any questions. Um, Mr. Kabaka, you've been very engaged through this whole session and we love and honor your time. Can we just um, hear from you perhaps what you're taking out of it or what question we have? Um, uh, Ms. Beatrice Karemi, you have also been, you are one of the first people to join in and you are very active. Could we please have a comment or a question from you? So um, Mr. Kabaka, please. Are you still on mute? Uh, okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to be in this session. Uh, unfortunately, I joined a bit late. I was unable to get a chance to join you people on time. I was trying to join with my laptop and uh, unfortunately it didn't work. So otherwise I'm so happy for this session. Uh, I joined not early enough, but uh, what I have gotten, I have taken notes and I'm very delighted to be in this forum. Uh, what I know is that uh, for us as parents, we have really concentrated on blaming ourselves for anything that happens. So when kids go wrong, we blame ourselves. We have not been able to actually help them to identify the solutions they can provide so that uh, they, they are able to identify how far they are. When they fail, we blame ourselves. Recently, we could divide children burning school in high schools. We would still blame parents, we blame teachers, but no blame for the children. So we have had a lot of self-blame, yet we are all running helter skelter, looking for something that we shall leave them as inheritance. And they're not even interested in selling because we want to leave them with something. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we grow old, we cannot even sell to buy something to eat or for medication. Mm -hmm. We want to leave them something, mm -hmm. some acres of land or plots. Mm -hmm. And these boys are not able to even recognize, even they cannot sustain a lengthy conversation with us uh, because they are busy. They have more time for their girlfriends and their boyfriends and no time for the parents. Yeah? Yeah. They cannot yeah. have any time for you and yet you are there they are earning, they are on payroll, you are retired, and they don't, and we are there clinging onto title deeds which we want to leave them. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, working for them, let us teach them how to work. Let us teach them how to have their own money. Uh, let us mentor them where we save, where do we get money? Mm -hmm. So they are busy asking uh, old people, get out of the way, we want to be in political seats. Uh, so, and they are there in athletics, we don't compete with them in athletics, we don't compete with them in football, but uh, they want to be where we are in politics. They are telling us, go away. Mm -hmm. Then come to the girl child, the mothers. The mother can complain that the husband is not bringing anything, but they are calling Kababa, yeah? They can buy anything for, for the child, but nothing for the father because the father brings nothing. Then when Kababa marries, then the wife will tell this woman, can you stick to your husband? This is my husband, go away. So I think this is the right thing to be in so that we can be able to take care of our children and we also take care of ourselves. Instead of uh, teaching them, uh, blaming ourselves for what they are going through, let us uh, guide them on why they went wrong. 
What could they have done differently so that they make it? Making a mistake is good, but uh, if you can guide them so that they don't make mistakes, the better. But uh, you find them a bit uh, uninterested in being guided. They want to make mistakes so that you come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you want to intervene, they, some, some are rebellious. If you try to tell them this is how things are done, uh, like uh, me, I have boys and girls, eh? and uh, I, uh, sometimes they can, uh, uh, you tell a person, remove a nail using a crowbar. They want a hammer, and they feel it can do okay. They want to make mistakes fast. But when you bring the crowbar, and you show them how simple it is, <laughs> they feel that you, you are elevating yourself. When I say, man, unajichocha sana, napeda chocha. So otherwise, I'm sorry for taking too much time. I don't know whether that is the time you wanted for me. And uh, I'm happy to be in this group. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for taking notes and being involved. And also thank you for bringing up that aspect of many times that uh, our parents tend to blame themselves. And I will ask Susan to speak into that. But before Susan speaks into that, um, I'd also like to hear from one other person, perhaps Beatrice, uh, as I called out earlier, are you in a position to, to share and speak? Okay, she might not be in a position. So I will go um, straight to what Rachel Knight is asking. How do you go about following your career, which seems to be far-fetched against the readily available opportunities that will help you pay your bills? Um, hmm. I will also throw that um, a little bit to Susan and a little bit to Gadoni. I know it's a bit of a deep end for you, Gadoni, but... Um, Depends is where we learn how to swim <laughs> and, and to thrive. So um, perhaps uh, Gadoni just weigh in on uh, what Mr. Kabaka has shared from where you are and what Rachel has asked and then Susan. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. I know we, we are not good on time, um, but Mr. Kabaka, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I have caused my, I won't share my life story, but I know I've caused my, my parents a lot of self-blame in many, many areas um, over the years. Um, and it's painful to hear from you. Trust me, there's, there's a day um, that will come when your children and your youth recognize the, the kind of impact they've had. Right now, at the stage they are in, unfortunately, they might not but you can rest assured there'll be a day their eyes open and they ask themselves what have they been doing right so have comfort in that the day is coming is it today i can't guarantee that um, but i'm speaking on on the end of uh, of a youth who recognized this some years back and said wow some things need to change right so that's the first thing the second thing is conversations can be hard to be honest with with parents sometimes um, because there's, it's almost a one-way street. There's a lot of teaching. There's a lot of telling. So I've had it many times, you know. You're not talking to us. You know, you want to spend time with, with your boyfriends, girlfriends, growing up, etc. But I always wondered, how comes, you know, I, I can talk to auntie, I can talk to uncle, and you grew up in the same household, but I can't talk to you. And sometimes the age gap is there. It's not there between... Let's say now you, Mr. Kabaka, and said uncle, right? But the difference is how the conversations were, were held, how they were conducted. They came from an approach of asking, how are you? What's going on? These days I hear people are into A, B, C, D, D, E, F. Teach me more. Tell me more. But with parents, a lot of the times, um, or let me speak for my scenario, I do know it felt like it was being imposed on me. I was being told what to do. What is the next step? What I should like, you know, et cetera. There were less questions and it was less of a conversation. But strangely, I could converse with my father's sister or my mother's brother, et cetera. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind as you engage with, you, with your youth. Then on to the question that, that was being asked about passion. Um, something interesting about today's workplaces, they cater to passion right 
Um, and I'll give you a, a live case scenario. Um, when we are recruiting, or when I was recruiting particularly for, for McKinsey and even for DHL, I would ask people, you know, what is their interest in their own special time, right? So I'll be told about their side hustles, what they are doing in their spare time, et cetera. And in my mind, I would actually be asking them this, not because it's a standard HR question, but because I'm trying to see the culture fit for my organization, right? Different companies have different clubs, right? We can call them clubs in this scenario or different activities we want to engage our employees on. So your passion can actually already be part and partial of the company you're trying to get into, applying to, or you're already in, right? At McKinsey specifically, I know we used to say, make your own McKinsey. And if you wanted to start a mentorship program and you had supporters, because that's what you enjoy, that's what gives you life, you can still do it within your nine to five that pays the bills. Because I think the tricky bit is, and uh, there's lots of controversy in me saying this, at the end of the day, we are in a region where you have to find a way to pay those bills because you could actually die, right? Your people can fall off the wagon, health bills, um, whichever other bills that are there, they need to be paid. That's just the truth of the matter, right? But can you have your nine to five and can you still have a passion on the side? You can I love speaking to, to youth. I love speaking about job employment, et cetera. I'm lucky I get to do it um, at this point in my career when I'm interviewing with people. But something like Lapid Leaders Forum is, is not paying me, but I'm here after working hours, feeding into that passion, right? So there could come a point that I decide I'll start my own Lapid Leaders and it will make money and I will have employees. But for now, I'm satisfied in knowing that I can still enjoy my passion and I can still pay my bills. There's actually a huge comfort in that. Um, so I'll pause there so that I hand over to, to Susan. We are two minutes much. over time. So Susan, please wrap it up quickly so that we can conclude and, and honor the time of our, our participants today. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, and I, let me just bounce off from where she started in terms of um, that balance between passion and having to pay the bills. Um, it's very, it's very important for us individuals to be able to do that, and even and allowing that to be also and recognizing that that's also a growth passion. Increasingly, more and more with this great shakeup, great resignation that um, Tindy mentioned is especially with the youth, they are following their passion. And that is part of what the great awakening um, shaking has done, the great re um, resignation has done. And it's also coming to where we are. And with Africa rising as well, there's a lot of scope for people chasing their passion. Yeah. A lot of the th industries, guys, that um, today we take, for example, we take for granted the light bulb, for example, the cars with the creation of cars, all these things, it was, it was ignited by passion. So the call that I would have for parents is whereas yes, there's absolutely got to be that balance between passion and paying bills, is we've also got to look at how we can encourage and create a support system around our children, around the youth, not only in terms of parents, but in the different forums we're in, to, get, to be able to support the youth in that because great innovation will come from there because they are better able, standing on our shoulders, they're better able to see um, into the future. And what sort of future they are going to create for your grandchildren. Yeah, that's important. And we buy into that. We can partner with them with that in terms of being able to support them in their passion and not insisting that they live our dream, that's very important. When we then come to the issue of parents blaming themselves, there's a dimension of where that I think is humanly natural because um, this is a child that was um, in my care. Where did I fail? How did I do? What did I not do? But there's something that I want us to be to do or rather we need to recognize and if we're in a position to be able to shift it and change it, 
it's excellent, is that it's the formative years. The years from zero to eight, seven, eight, that's the time we need to inculcate our values into the children. Trying to inculcate values, um, our moral values, work ethics, all that, when they're 15, 16, is going to lose it. It's at that age when we begin to create a safe space for them to come and talk to us. So it becomes, again, a very fine balance between being a, a, a friend who they can confide in without fear of retribution, without fear of punishment, and on the other hand, being an authoritative figure. And that calls for a lot of this. Yet, because as Gadoni said, she could not talk to her parents, but she can talk to her auntie, her uncle, so and so. And that's because the auntie is a recognized authority figure without, but also at the same time being a friend. So I think that is what we've got to do, but also where we are. I think the first thing as parents you can do where we are, where you are with uh, young adults is learn to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for the mistakes you've made. Two, humble yourself before your child. This will work miracles. They, they will be like, what's just happened? But humble yourself before your child and tell them sorry for where you went wrong and where you did not listen to them, where you did not give them a voice. That will break that barrier. It will begin to break it. And then follow it through with actions of continuously listening to them. When they've gone off and they're rebellious or whatever, they will begin to come back. Because what we also call rebellion, as I wrap up last point, what we consider many times to be rebellion is just them trying to find who they are, find the self-expression. And therefore, anything that you say, doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, will be a no-no because you've not allowed them, you've not allowed them to self-express. But if we can give them and give them that, that um, safe space where they can self-express, it becomes much easier. Thank you. Back to you, Timmy. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Gadoni. Even if Jemima has left us, we tell her thank you because these people have given us their time, their experience, their perspective. And I just want to draw this to a close and sort of like just wrap up um, in a neat little package um, what has been shared today. One of where we started um, really was um, about uh, what we're noticing uh, with the participants uh, in LAPID leaders, that they're having a very hard time expressing themselves to their parents or even getting their support as they do the LAPID leaders. And some of the things that I've had is, you know, my mother is saying that uh, I need to focus on my education and everything else is a waste of time. Uh, somebody else is saying, oh, my parents think I'm being rebellious when I shut myself in my room in the evenings to take part in these classes. Someone else is saying, or um, if it's not schoolwork, if it's not the degree, uh, I'm not being encouraged to do this, so I have to hide and do this. And then we find that some of the participants, um, the Lapid Leaders experience has three pillars, which is Lead Self, Lead Marketplace, and Lead Africa. And each of them take between 12 and 14 weeks. So by the time you're seeing somebody who is doing Lead Africa saying that they have been hiding uh, from their parents so that they can do the program, uh, it, it really just brings us to the fore it brings to the fore that there are maybe communication issues because all both parties uh, are trying to do what will they know will um, give them a better chance in the job market, but there is no communication as to what looks like. And that is why this conversation we started with what what is the conversation out there about African youth? Because our children are African youth. They're the ones we're talking about. They're the ones that Europe and the US and the Asians are looking into as, as, as resources, as workers, as a market. It's our children, it's our young people. Um, do they know that? Uh, are we prepared for that? Um, I, I, I understand that it's, it would be risky um, if we are not prepared for the attention of the world in Africa, but I also see more the good than the bad because for too many years, Africa has been forgotten. It's about time that the world realizes who Africa is. And they will do that with our children who stand on our shoulders. 
So what does that mean? What does a job ready young person looks like? Uh, Gadoni has, has, has gave us an overview, a very, very um, top level overview of what she's looking for, communication, confidence, uh, self-awareness, emotional intelligence. Uh, we had Jemima here who onboards a new recruit and, and she um, supported what uh, Gadoni was saying that communication is a big deal, self-esteem is a big deal. Um, having a whole person coming to the workplace is a big deal. Um, and perhaps the areas where we as the support system behind them can, can then stand up and become their mentors, perhaps give them guidance on how to invest or take care of their money so that when they're in the office, they can bring their best game forward. Susan has talked about um, the process of learning and unlearning learning and the importance of failure. Actually, all of us have spoken about the importance of failure and, and to forgive ourselves. You know, for me, usually what I say is, will, will they die? As long as they're not dead, that means it can be fixed so we can work with that. Yeah, so um, we want to thank you so much, each one of you for giving us your time. And we pray that wherever you are, if you have a young person who's doing rapid leaders, support them, ask questions, sit in on some of the classes. They're very provocative, Karibu sana. Um, and they open our minds to the possibilities out there. If your children are not yet at the place of doing the Lapid Leaders program, that's okay. But begin to understand that their world is very different from yours. And at some point, they will be the ones telling you what the world is like, and it's okay. And then to close, I just want to, to finish with a story that is just dancing somewhere at the back of my mind. And it's about a lady who would argue with her daughter, argue, push the daughter to a corner. And one day the daughter got tired and she decided she's going to fight back. And when the daughter came back and fought back for her space and her right, the mother was like, good. I have done my job. I wanted you to stand up to me. Because if you can stand up to me, you can stand up to anyone in the world who's pushing you against the wall. So sometimes we need to interrogate what this is that we call rebellion. It could be a young person searching for their identity. It could also be a young person searching for their voice. Sometimes you sit and play a fool and see where this is going to go. Because at the end of the day, that is the fight that they need to succeed out there. So I want to thank you for giving us your time. Uh, if you're interested in anything to do with Lapid Leaders and to find out more, we have been calling. Most of you have gotten a call or an SMS or an email. Feel free to ask your questions by email, send us, drop us a line, and we continue to engage and see how we can create a better environment for our young people to be the best that they can really be. Otherwise, Asanteni, 